Welcome to my channel. I am Daisy, your hostess. In this video, we are going through the book titled Looking Out for Number One. How to Get from Where You Are Now to Where You Want to Be in Life by Robert Ringer. If you found me at this video, I want to say welcome, welcome. Hopefully there is some golden nugget and there's a reason why you landed at this video. And to you who have subscribed to the channel, I want to say thank you for being a part of this community. Thank you for leaving me your comments, your likes, your shares, and also the super thanks. From the bottom of my heart, I am grateful for your support and your contribution. Truly, I cannot thank you enough. So bringing it back to this content here, I want to say that if you just found us at this video and would like to catch up on the previous chapters, please do visit the book playlist. You'll access them there and also other books. Now, the previous chapter was the financial hurdle, and I have to tell you, it had a lot of golden nuggets in there. Sure, it seemed like the author was definitely speaking from experience. There were a lot of stories that he was talking about, and it's amazing how that financial hurdle involves a lot of players. But at the end of the day, I believe, just as he said, that it does not matter where we're at on that ladder, whether at the bottom, somewhere in the middle, you know, at the end of the day, we all deserve to live a very good life and, you know, one that is worth living. And to do that, we must get through some of these hurdles and the financial hurdle, I have to tell you from, from my own experience, it has been one of the biggest struggles, but there's been with it so many lessons that are of value that I know I don't ever want to repeat again. And with that, I still wouldn't take those experiences away from my life because they were the ones that taught me the lessons and also made me stronger. And you know what? At the end of the day, we all have a choice. And that choice is also asking the question, are we willing to pay the price to go after what we want, to live the quality of life that we want? That's the big question. But you know what? There are many more answers and a lot of golden nuggets, like I mentioned in that previous chapter. So please, when you get a chance, head back over there to the book playlist and grab that. Let's move on now to this next chapter. So sit back and let's learn about the next hurdle. Dedicated to the hope that somewhere in our universe, there exists a civilization whose inhabitants possess sole dominion over their own lives, where every individual has the ability to recognize and the courage to acknowledge reality, and where governments as we know them do not exist. Chapter 6 The People Hurdle Human beings can be the source of so many of life's problems that it's essential to learn the art of dealing effectively with all makes and models in the people store. There are five human realities in particular that one needs to understand and effectively deal with in order to clear the people hurdle. Human reality number one imperfection. It's back to is's versus ought to's. Another human being is not what you think he ought to be. He is what he is. Deluding oneself about a person's true nature is not only self-deceitful, but self-destructive as well. First and foremost, human beings are imperfect. The failure to come to grips with this reality can be the source of endless frustration and disappointment. We want so badly for people to be perfect that we often hurt ourselves by expecting too much of them. Once you accept the reality of man's imperfection, it's much easier to understand that the issue is not whether or not people will hurt you. Rather, it's a matter of whether or not you allow them to hurt you. This hurt is often the result not only of your inability to cope with someone's imperfection, but of taking it upon yourself to try change a person into something he's not. If you insist on engaging in such a presumptuous task, you are guaranteed to experience the futility that comes with trying to overcome the impossible. 
This futility is especially evident in dealing with those closest to you, friends, spouses, parents, and children are people too. As such, they are subject to the same human imperfections as everyone else. However, because of their close proximity to you, they are in a position to cause you much more pain than others, if you allow them to. By accepting the imperfection of people in our life, you dramatically reduce their ability to disappoint and hurt you. Human reality number two, self-interest. Through years of experience, I have come to the conclusion that all disagreements regarding the subject of self-interest versus altruism are not really disagreements at all. Rather, they are a matter of semantics. If you help an old lady to cross the street, you do so because it makes you feel good. The absolute moralist, however, insists that he performs the same deed out of sheer altruism. Alas, he deludes himself. The fact is that your action and his are one and the same. It is only the words, semantics, used to describe your actions that are different. When the absolute moralist says that he helped an old lady cross the street, can he seriously deny that it made him feel good? I suppose he could split hairs and say that his good feeling was only a result of doing an altruistic deed, while your good feelings was the intent of your good deed. But let's examine that argument more closely. First of all, the old lady doesn't give a hoot why either of you helped her. She's just happy to get to the other side of the street. Second, what's wrong with doing a good deed for the reason that it makes you feel good? Did Mother Teresa do her admirable humanitarian work because it made her feel bad? If the absolute moralist really was thinking in altruistic terms, it wouldn't be so important to him to try to convince others that his good feeling came about only as an unintended side benefit. Fourth, his good feeling was not an unintended benefit. Whether or not he consciously thought about it, he would not have helped the old lady cross the street if he didn't feel good about doing it. Methinks what the absolute moralist in this case really needs is a good shrink to delve into his childhood problems and comb out his obviously tangled neurons. There are so many defective neurons in today's world is why I decided I could not, in good conscience, avoid the issue of self-interest versus altruism. Few words have a more negative connotation than the term self-interest. When I was a kid, four-letter words were the ones you uttered secretly behind your parents' backs. But self-interest was a term you dared not even think about. Early on, you learned to hiss and boo anyone who proclaimed self-interest as a virtue. Why has self-interest always been such a taboo subject? What is it about the reality of self-interest that sends so many people into a state of near hysteria? I believe the reason self-interest gets such a bad rap is that it is a threat to those who would like you to continue acting in their best interest instead of your own. Rational self-interest is not a problem, i.e. self-interest that does not involve forcible interference in the lives of others harms no one. The problem is the irrational self-interest of those who do not want you to act in your own best interest, who want to interfere in your life by pressuring you into doing what makes them happy. No matter how vehemently some people may protest to the contrary, the reality is that self-interest is genetically programmed into every human being. You have no choice in the matter. However, 
If you are rational about self-interest, you chiefly regard your own interest, but not solely. Common sense tells you that you must regard the interests of others, especially loved ones and friends, in order to lead a fulfilling life. Fellow human beings represent potential values to you, both in business and personal relationships. In order to harvest those values, you must add value to the lives of others. For this reason, the individual who practices rational self-interest is also a giving person because he understands the soundness of mutually beneficial relationships. On the other hand, when someone who is perceived to be altruistic does something for you, you've not likely to be impressed. Why? Because if he gives to everyone, even people he does not admire or respect, it has a diluting effect on the value of his gifts. I'm wary of gifts from supposedly altruistic people because I don't like being in the dark about what the eventual payment might be, especially if it involves compound interest over a long period of time, which all too often is the case. I am not anxious to accumulate a lot of unspoken accountables payable. When at some future date, the so-called altruistic person taps me on the shoulder and lets me know, perhaps in a subtle way, that the due date has arrived, my concern is that I may not be in a position to pay the debt. Don't deceive yourself on this one. Recognize the reality that gifts from the professed altruistic almost always have hidden price tags and they are usually greater than what you would have been willing to pay had the price been made clear from the outset. On the other hand, when you receive a gift from a person who practices rational self-interest, it is evidence of the value he places on his relationship with you. The self-interest issue makes it clear why looking out for number one requires conscious, rational effort. Subconsciously, of course, you will always make decisions that you believe are in your best interest, but there are times when you may delude yourself. Nevertheless, the fact that you are the one making the decisions guarantees that you are at least attempting to act in your own best interest. Hard as it is for many people to understand, even so-called saints make decisions which they believe will make them happy. Take Mahatma Gandhi, the world-famous Indian ascetic who peacefully crusaded, primarily through fasting, for India's independence. Do I really believe that Mahatma Gandhi acted in his own self-interest when he fasted almost to the point of starvation for the people of India? It's much stronger than just a belief. It is a DNA certainty. Noble as his actions may have been, Gandhi was still a human being, and the actions of all human beings are chosen from the alternatives available to them at any given time. Whatever Mahatma Gandhi did, whether it was out of rationale or irrational choice, it was because he chose to do it. If he acted in the hopes that he would bring happiness to others, then that was the method he chose to seek his own happiness. As with the Mother Teresa example mentioned earlier, Gandhi didn't lead a non-violent movement to gain India's independence from the British Empire because he thought it would make him unhappy. It is only the means people choose to achieve their happiness that differ. In the case of Mahatma Gandhi, his methods for seeking personal gratification achieved results that were enormously beneficial for millions of his fellow countrymen. While most of us would agree that Mahatma Gandhi and Mother Teresa were noble people, the same cannot be said of most martyrs. There is a fine line between someone who rationally seeks happiness by helping others and someone who seeks happiness for the sole reason of being a martyr. The latter is an irrationally selfish person with an enormous ego, an ego that must be continually fed adulation. It's wise to be wary of a martyr's supposedly selfless act.
most cases, of course, we don't consciously think about our actions toward loved ones. Even when you punish a child for inappropriate behavior, though you may feel badly about it, you believe you would feel even worse if you allowed him to get away with something that would be harmful to him either now or in the future. In summation, it's important to recognize that there is no such thing as altruism in the true sense of the word, which is extremely difficult for Mr. Magoos and ostriches to accept. There is only rational and irrational self-interest. If by altruism a person means that he is literally sacrificing himself or others, then what he is really talking about is nothing more than irrational self-interest. Mistakenly doing what he believes will make him happy by surrendering a higher value to a lower value. Be wary of those who sincerely believe that their actions are altruistic, for they are far more vain and dangerous than those who only fake altruism, e.g. politicians and Hollywood types, in an effort to gain popularity. Such people have the capacity to do serious damage to those around them. Thus, self-interest is neither bad nor good. It is simply a reality of human nature. But when you engage in irrational acts of self-interest, you are likely to hurt yourself and others. By contrast, when you engage in rational acts of self-interest, not only are you likely to experience more pleasure and less pain, your actions will often benefit others. Therefore, doing what is in your best interest and doing what is in the best interest of others are not mutually exclusive objectives. From this day forward, resolve never again to cringe at the term self-interest and instead accept it as a reality of the human psyche. Human reality number three, the definition game. People love to play games and one of their favorites is the definition game. The definition game theory states, every word, every act, Every situation in life is defined by each individual subjectively, usually in such a way as to fit in comfortably with his own actions and or the circumstances of the moment. Whether or not we realize it, we are all participants in the definition game. Because each of us is a unique human being with varying desires, tastes, prejudices, experiences, and personality traits, we see things through our own mental paradigms. Which is why it's prudent to assume that everyone, consciously or unconsciously, uses a definition guide that looks something like this. Good is what I do. Bad is what you do. Right is what I do. Wrong is what you do. Honest is what I do. Dishonest is what you do. Fair is what I do. Unfair is what you do. Moral is what I do. Immoral is what you do. Ethical is what I do. Unethical is what you do. On and on the game goes. If you have a realistic insight into how the definition game is played, you will be far less likely to assume that others are in tune with you when you think you are having a perfectly harmonious discussion. The story of life overflows with tales of people nodding their heads in agreement, shaking hands, then facing each other in a courtroom at some future date. No doubt, there were many occasions in prehistoric times when two Neanderthal men grunted affirmatively and walked away satisfied that they had agreed on some important point only to end up trying to club each other to death a short time later when they realized they had misunderstood each other's grunts. The two big advantages they had over us were that there were no attorneys around to make matters worse and they didn't have to wait two or three years for their cases to come to court. What further complicates the definition game is that people have a habit of changing their definitions as they go along. 
This is usually the result of one's established definitions being incompatible with his current actions. An absolute moralist, in particular, in his unceasing efforts to convert you to his beliefs, plays the definition game with an unmatched fervor. If only he can succeed in intimidating you into accepting his definitions, he will have laid the groundwork for getting you to act in his best interest rather than your own. Another way of looking at the definition game is to be found in the victimizer-victim theory, which states, The victim is always you. The victimizer is always the other guy. In other words, victimizing is something the other person does to you. It's never what you do to him. Why is being a victim such an attractive label to so many people? Because by seeing himself as a victim, a person is able to justify just about any kind of immoral action. It is this human defect that provides the populist fuel for mischievous politicians who shamelessly insist that their actions are the benefit of the middle class. The dictionary only makes matter worse because most words have many definitions, which in turn only encourages people to customize the definition of words to their liking. The problem with using the dictionary definition of a word is that you also have to look up the definition of the words that are used to define that word. If you try this a few times, I think you'll arrive at the conclusion that the dictionary, in effect, leaves the real world definition up to each individual. Take a favorite definition game word such as right. One dictionary I looked at defines it as follows. Right, in accordance with what is just or good just in accordance with what is right immediately you reach an impasse right is in accordance with what is just and just is in accordance with what is right so in effect webster has said to us you guys work it out i don't want to get involved which precisely why each individual defines words in accordance with what he wants them to mean what's your definition of right is it the same as your neighbor's the same is true of honesty. When you say that someone is dishonest, what you really mean is that you and he differ on the definition of honesty because he most likely believes that you are dishonest. That's why it's so important that your moral standards fit your guidelines for morality rather than someone else's. Never allow another person to be so presumptuous asked to tell you what your moral code should be. Human reality number four, the line drawing game. The line drawing game theory states, every individual subjectively draws his own lines with regard to right and wrong, based either on his moral standards, the moral standards of some person or group, or moral standards that are convenient for him at any given time. The line drawing game is something of a corollary of the definition game. Not only do people define words to justify their actions, they also define words by their actions. As with the definition game, every human being is a participant in the line drawing game, whether or not he is conscious of it. Through a person's actions and inactions, he advertises to the world on which side of which lines he stands. Whether or not we are consciously aware of it, we draw our lines where they are needed to justify our own behavior and our own particular set of circumstances. For example, when a person steals groceries because he believes he has a right to eat, his actions clearly reveal his definition of the word right. When a homicide bomber kills innocent civilians, he undoubtedly believes that his actions are based on sound moral principles. His misguided maniacal actions speak worlds about his definition of the word moral. Every individual arbitrarily draws his lines between right and wrong carefully placing those lines in such a way as to be certain that his actions will always lie on the side of right. 
Where another individual draws his lines may seem immoral to you, but such an individual is unlikely to be interested in your opinion of right and wrong. He may, however, see your opinions as a justifiable cause to declare war on you. Problems begin to set in when absolute moralists decide to start drawing lines for people other than themselves. Since billions of individuals can never agree on all things at all times, a statement such as, someone has to draw the line somewhere, is a euphemism for, do it my way. No one has the knowledge, let alone the moral authority, to be a line drawer for others. Unfortunately, there has never been a scarcity of crusaders, bureaucrats, and would-be dictators willing to step forward and draw lines for their fellow citizens. And since it is impossible for every member of a society to simultaneously agree on anything, let alone everything, any line drawn by others, whether under the guise of a commandment, law, or dictum, is destined to make many people unhappy. Property rights constitute an area where real, physical lines are drawn. How far back should we go to determine who originally occupied an area of land? Every government in control of an area of land today draws a line that assures that its ownership is valid. It is not about to lend credence to the reality that the land it now occupies was taken from some other group of people decades, hundreds, or even thousands of years earlier. When it comes to matters of land ownership, current possession is, indeed, nine-tenths of the law. That is what makes the so-called Israeli occupation argument such a red herring. Even if the Palestinians had owned the land now occupied by the Israelis, which they did not, it wouldn't matter. When a large part of the Arab world again attacked Israel in 1967, openly stating that its objective was to push all Israelis into the sea, Israel crushed its attackers and, as any rational person would have expected, took some Arab land in the process. Welcome to the world of reality. As I said, every piece of land on the globe is now controlled by a government that took it, by force, from someone else. The most important point Arabs made with their 1967 attack on Israel was that if you don't want your land to be taken from you, an excellent way to avoid such a fate is to not attempt to annihilate another nation. Court fights over rightful land titles are common, with title companies employed to trace ownership back to the original owners. The only problem with title searches is that they go back only to the point where the line was arbitrarily drawn by the most recent conquerors of a given geographic area. All discussions of property rights begin with the premise that the original owner of a given piece of land was the first owner after it was taken by force from some other group of people. Understandably, American Indians, New Zealand Morris, and Australian Aborigines don't give much validity to title searches. As with the definition game, what considerably complicates the matter is that, in addition to the fact that everyone draws his lines subjectively, people are so constantly erasing old lines and drawing new ones to conform to changing circumstances. One of the reasons this occurs so frequently is that a majority of people do not take the trouble to analyze the moral standards by which they want to live their lives. As a result, whenever they happen to want something that is on the wrong side of one of their lines, they simply relocate that line so it falls on their side of the line. Such line drawing tactics are commonly referred to as situational ethics. Never allow yourself to be intimidated by the line drawing decisions of others. Make it clear to those who would intimidate you into agreeing with them that you require no help in deciding where to place your lines. By the same token, where others wish to draw their line is their business, so long as those lines do not infringe on your freedom. Though we have no choice when it comes to government laws and decrees, it is within our power to resist the urge 
to draw lines for others. Human reality number five, irrationality. Irrational is the opposite of rational, the latter referring to words and actions based on logic and reason. Unfortunately, all human beings are irrational at least some of the time, but occasional irrationality is not a major problem. People problems arise from those who are excessively and consistently irrational. To clear the people hurdle, you have to become adept at spotting irrationality in others and, just as important, at monitoring and controlling your thought processes to assure that your own words and actions are rational. Since each individual's definition of reason and logic may vary, how can you be certain whose perception of rationality is correct? From a long-term perspective, the answer is simple. The irrational person will usually fail to achieve his objectives, while the rational person will usually succeed. As a simple guideline for making rational decisions, you should develop the habit of asking yourself two questions. First, does my proposed action have the potential to better my existence, either by bringing me more pleasure or less pain? Second, will my action in any way infringe on anyone else's natural rights? Remember, to take action that is happiness-oriented, you have to be aware of what you're doing and why you're doing it. And to accomplish that, you must possess an accurate perception of reality, the very foundation of looking out for number one. If the actions a person takes to enrich his life are contrary to the facts, then such actions are irrational. Whether he acts in opposition to reality because of a malfunction of his reasoning powers or because he deceives himself is irrelevant. In either case, he is destined to suffer bad consequences over the long term. In Atlas Shrugged, John Galt explains why irrationality automatically negates the possibility of happiness when he states, quote, Happiness is possible only to a rational man. The man who desires nothing but rational goals, seeks nothing but rational values, and finds his joy in nothing but rational actions. End quote. Facts can be ascertained when your intellect, rather than your emotions, is in control. During periods of relaxed solitude, when there is nothing to distract your thoughts, you should think about the philosophical issues that most affect your life. Then have enough confidence in your analysis to remain loyal to your predetermined code of behavior when inevitable encounters with irrational people occur. Make a written in stone commitment well in advance not to allow your emotions to sway you in your time of need. One word of caution. Just because you act rationally, don't assume that everyone around you will do likewise. They won't. The path to a happy life is obstructed by irrational people who are ready, willing, and able to scramble your gray matter if you aren't properly equipped to deal with them. Spotting an Irrational Argument How do you know when someone is being irrational? First, you have to learn to see past a person's words to his premise because you may find that you don't agree with that premise. For example, if an interviewer asks me a question such as, you aren't really interested in helping others, are you? I have no way of responding to such a question without asking the interviewer to first define his words. If by others he is alluding to all people, then my answer is no. There are terrorists, child molesters, and absolute moralists whom I do not wish to help in any way. Yet I have very deep feelings for many people, primarily those individuals who add value to my life 
and I am always interested in helping such people. The same is true of the word helping. If by helping the questioner means giving others something for nothing, again, my answer is no. I am, however, more than happy to help if it means doing something for an individual with whom I have a valuable relationship. I have no desire to distribute love, friendship, money, or any other valuable commodity indiscriminately to anyone who happens to cross my path. To do so would lessen the value of what I have to offer people whom I genuinely care about, such as friends, family, and business associates. Neither do I wish to receive love, friendship, money, or anything else of value from anyone who has not received or does not expect to receive something of value from me. Never feel obliged to answer a question until the asker defines his terms. If you find that a question is based on what you consider to be a false premise, then any answer you give will be dishonest. I often find that when I unmask the premise, no meaningful question exists. Rather, it becomes a hypothetical question. A meaningful question deals with reality. A hypothetical question is a forced illusion. I don't have time to clutter my mind with hypothetical questions based on false premises. The illogical person tips his hand in many other ways, but you have to be alert to pick up on the signs. Irrational people stray from the main point. They dwell on the irrelevant. They rely on non-factual slogans. They generalize. They use invalid analogies. And they are masters of proving a point by simply restating it as a fact, a technique commonly referred to as a priori argument. Regardless of the tactic employed, the objective is similar to that of a magician, politician, or criminal defense attorney. Distract the person's attention from the real issue. Perhaps the most common behavioral pattern of the irrational person is emotional excess. Whenever I feel strongly about making a point, I remind myself of the telltale observation by Queen Gertrude in Shakespeare's Hamlet. The lady doth protest too much, methinks. The more one belabors a point, the more skeptical I become. The louder one talks, the more I back off. Indignation raises doubts in the minds of those to whom you wish to make your point. Again, the power of the understatement is enormous. Say it once. Say it calmly. Say it firmly. If your point is rational, state it in a rational manner. Every statement beyond that is counterproductive. What I'm referring to here is the protesting lady theory, which states, The more someone dwells on a point, the more likely it is that the opposite is true. If you pay close attention to the remarkable consistency of this principle, your friends will think you're clairvoyant. Following are a few examples of how you might employ the principle underlying the protesting lady theory in everyday life. Statement I've got it all together now. Translation I'm so screwed up that I'm past the point of even acknowledging it. Statement My wife and I never argue. We're more in love today than we were newlyweds. We have the perfect marriage. Translation My marriage is a bore. My wife and I hardly speak and I'm just waiting for the right time to file for a divorce. Statement I'm making money hand over fist, pay cash for everything, got it made. Translation I'm one step ahead of the sheriff, my Mercedes is on a month-to-month -month lease, and unless a miracle happens, I'll be belly up within a month. Beware of the person who overstates his case. He's sending you a message, but you have to be alert to hear it. Should you ever find yourself trying too hard to impress a listener, best you re-examine the facts, as well as your motives, because there's a good chance you may be acting irrationally. Clearing the Weeds 
to the extent you allow weeds to grow and remain in your life's garden, you are asking for a great deal of unnecessary frustration and turmoil. The weeds that grow most out of control are known as neurotics, i.e. people with emotional disorders. Actually, each of us is a little neurotic in one area or another, at least on some occasions. But it's those people who have either too many neuroses or a specific neurosis that is extreme who have the potential to seriously disrupt your life. Eliminating people problems requires that you become skilled at spotting neurotic traits in those around you and developing the self-discipline to ignore those who are severely afflicted. Fortunately, you have a weapon at your disposal that gives you the capacity to remove most of the people weeds from your life. The weapon I am referring to is encompassed in the anti-neurotic theory which states, ignore all irrational remarks and actions of normal people and all remarks and actions, irrational or otherwise, of neurotic people. Have you ever had a person say or do something to you that was so outrageous it made you feel like picking up the telephone and describing the details to everyone you know? Have you ever been so frustrated by someone's neurotic actions that you felt like roaming the streets and explaining it to anyone and everyone who will stop and listen to you? Such a reaction is known as big mistake. If what a person said or did was so outrageous, that's reason enough not to waste your time explaining it to anyone. Why further aggravate yourself? Worse, if it's truly outrageous, others might even think you're exaggerating. The most rational way to handle such a situation is to simply ignore it. When your instinct is to rant and rave about a grave injustice that has been done to you, granted, it's very difficult to keep your mouth shut and blank the matter out of your mind. Nevertheless, the painful self-discipline required to do so is well worth the price because you will absolutely love yourself in the morning. The Compromise If a neurotic person refuses to be ignored, does that mean you're helpless? Is a compromise in order? No. If your objective is to make certain that a person will continue to act irrationally, you need only to give in to his neurosis by compromising. When you compromise, even if it's only 1%, what you're really doing is giving in. If a person displays excessive neurotic behavior that is causing you persistent discomfort, you owe it to yourself, as well as to him, not to give him hope by allowing your relationship to drag on. The problem with compromising is that it encourages irrationality and that in turn prolongs the inevitable moment when you will be forced to face up to the reality that the relationship must end. And like all problems whose permanent solutions are postponed, when that inevitable moment finally arrives, it will be that much more difficult to close the door. That's because the passage of time will have given the neurotic individual the illusion that you've resolved your differences. The debate. Another common mistake people make with neurotics is to engage in ongoing discussions in an attempt to reach an agreement on who is in the right. Discussion in itself is not a bad thing, provided the individual with whom you are having the discussion is rational. But when a discussion reaches an impasse, or the other person becomes irrational, you begin to enter the dangerous area of the debate, a classic exercise in futility. When the debate enters the picture, it's your cue to exit. In using the word discussion, I'm referring to a calm, rational analysis of the facts. By debate, I'm referring to an irrational exchange of words in which at least one party either clings to a false premise, talks in a loud and or harsh tone as though he believes he can somehow drown out the facts, or employs meaningless slogans, broad sweeping statements, or slanderous words as some sort of proof that he is right. Debating gives hope 
to the wounded neurotic because he believes all things are possible via this verbal spider web. The debate is a miraculous channel through which an illusion can be created that logic and reason do not exist. The professional debater can dangle an irresistible carrot under your nose. He is accomplished at saying things that are so illogical that it's difficult to avoid the temptation to prove him wrong. If you take his bait and answer a question based on a false premise, it becomes a kind of implied consent in his mind, which only encourages him to raise the verbal stakes. Since he has no intention of using logic in his argument, he can easily escape your reasoning trap by jumping from one ill-founded premise to another. It takes a lot of self-discipline to ignore those who would entice you into a debate. But the first time you succeed in turning your back on a neurotic debater, you'll experience a wonderful feeling of self-respect. Such self-respect is derived from the knowledge that you are above dignifying irrational chatter. But to accomplish this, you must dare to precipitate a crisis. You have to have the courage to confront the neurotic in a civil but straightforwardly manner and make your desire to opt out of your relationship with him crystal clear. And should he become a nasty about it, don't make the mistake of reciprocating. State your case in a calm, civilized, firm manner, being as pleasant as circumstances will allow. Then excuse yourself and head for the nearest exit. Talking, arguing, or even begging does not work with an irrational person, and attempting to persuade him through logical argument will only frustrate you. If he's clever, you will often find yourself boxed into being damned if you do and damned if you don't. In short, dealing with an irrational person is a can't-win proposition. You know you're in a can't-win situation when anything you say, no matter how well-intended, ups the debating ante. If someone constantly surrounds you on all sides with irrational arguments, it's a signal that it's time for you to take control of your life. Do whatever is necessary to remove yourself from his presence, but do remove yourself. The most certain way to create enemies is to allow neurotic people to remain in your life. If Instead, you choose to ignore a neurotic individual, he may pout for a while, but the odds are that he will eventually go away and bother someone else who is more disposed to do battle with him. A neurotic person would much prefer to devote his energies to someone who is willing to vigorously argue with him. Ignoring isn't a matter of just refusing to acknowledge the individual who is trying to harass you. It means totally ignoring him, which in turn means totally ignoring all of his words and actions. Continual contact with a neurotic individual can lead to second-guessing yourself. Figuratively speaking, an accomplished neurotic can make you believe that day is night and that 2 plus 2 equals 5. Can you imagine a worse nightmare than rattling the bars of your cage and having peanuts being tossed to you by a neurotic individual whom you carelessly allow to remain in your life? Being involved with a neurotic person puts you in danger of becoming a victim of the I'm crazy, you're sane theory, which states, if you allow a neurotic individual to remain in your life, you run the risk of his convincing you that he is perfectly sane and that you're the one who's crazy. Exit stage right, which includes compromising, is the equivalent of taking an aspirin for a headache. But when you completely eliminate a neurotic from your life, you are effecting a permanent cure. The neurotic not only will leave you alone, but in all likelihood, he'll forget about you. It's only when you allow him to remain in your life and try to help him see the light through reason and logic that you remain at the forefront of his mind. In cases where a neurotic individual persists even after you have shown him a complete lack of attention, you must be strong enough to take swift and firm action to make it clear that you wish to terminate your relationship with him. This may sound harsh, but you have no moral obligation to deal with irrational people. 
you need not accept unpleasantness for the sake of keeping the peace. You have a right to live your life as you please, so long as you are not harming anyone else. It's also a serious mistake to attempt to change a neurotic person. Like you, the neurotic has a right to live his life as he pleases, without interference from others. That, however, does not mean his cause is hopeless. It's always possible that he may get well on his own, and who knows, at some future point in time, he could become a rose in your life's garden. But until and unless such an unlikely transformation occurs, you should make it a point to steer clear of him. By doing so, you will save yourself a considerable amount of aggravation and at the same time, spare the neurotic a crutch that will only worsen his neurosis. Remember, people will bother you until you no longer allow them to. Those who consistently exasperate you should be eliminated from your life, while those who display rational, positive qualities should be looked upon as welcome additions. Decide how you want to live your life. Then proceed accordingly as though there were no irrational people around to bother you. If you allow neurotic individuals to have an effect on your decisions, you'll be out of control which is a condition that is not in harmony with looking out for number one. You're on your way to clearing the people hurdle when you become proficient at redirecting the energy you once used for hassling with neurotic people to finding ways to attract rational people who can add value to your life. End of chapter. Could you be kind enough, hit that like button. If you like what you see here, if you have someone that may benefit from this chapter, please do share it with your friends or family. And now let's go on to the next chapter, The Friendship Hurdle. Interesting. Meet you there.